Um, I'm Sharon Constanson, I'm Chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce and we are based in the UK and I'd like to welcome everyone from all over the globe that are joining us today, particularly those from South Africa and those from the UK. This has been a very busy week for the Chamber. We've had a number of events this week and last week and we have got more next week and next month. Uh, quite a busy schedule, so please keep uh, in touch with our website to see what we are uh, producing and all the various topics of interest. We like to work with our strategic partners, which is what we are doing this time, or with our platinum members. And Hogan Levels is a strategic partner of the Chamber and a very valuable partner for us in many, many ways. And today we're doing this, this project together and Andrew Skipper, who's head of Africa, will be leading the, moderating the session. The importance of um, Africa in the global supply chains is actually quite critical and I think the COVID uh, virus, the trade wars in the northern hemisphere have given us a, a, a real insight into how South Africa, Africa can actually provide produce, manufactured goods and solutions to the globe. It's not just the northern hemisphere that can be looking after itself. And we are going to be hearing from a number of very different people from very different perspectives as to how Africa can be of value. Now, obviously, we've got Brexit here in the UK, which is an, an added reason why we are looking at Africa from a UK perspective as well. So we'll be looking at that during the session. So today will be very much a conversation, no speeches. It will just be having between the moderator who knows some of the people, doesn't know some of the others, and having a conversation about the areas where they have their speciality. Now, normally we go through things like health and safety. I hope you know where the front door of your house is or your office is, because that's where most of you are. And I'd like you to sit back for the next hour, enjoy, but please use the Q&A function the more you put in the questions during the conversation, the more we can get those questions going quite quickly afterwards. Please type them in. Uh, I will be pulling them together and I'll be collating questions and putting them to the relevant panel person after the conversation is finished. We're going to be here for an hour. We'll be finished on the hour, uh, which will be 11 o'clock UK time, 1 o'clock South African time. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Andrew Skipper, who is head of Hogan Lovell's Africa practice, co-chair of the UK government's Africa Investors Group and member of the Council of Royal African Society, the Royal Africa Society. He's also on our advisory board, which is very, very important. The most important role out of all of them, Andrew, who has come on camera. All the of other course. panelists are welcome to come on camera. And um, gets involved in the working group on legal services for UK and Nigeria Economic Development Forum. And he's co-vice chair of the advisory board of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. One thing you know, F Andrew loves his art. So I'm not quite sure how he's coped with this in lockdown. So that's going to be my final question you can answer. Um, and he's also a regular commentator on African affairs and also runs a very, very nice podcast series as well. And of course, it's important because I've been one of his podcasters. Um, and I'd like to at this point, please hand over to Andrew, take us through why Africa is so important in the global supply chain opportunities. Thank you, Sharon, and thanks for that um, extensive introduction. I, uh, you now know all who all know who I am. I'm Andrew Skipper, and I head up the Africa practice of Hogan Lovells. And uh, uh, it's great to be able to have this conversation. There's been a lot of conversations in this space um, in the last few months, but uh, uh, this is a good time. And I've got a fantastic group of people with me to talk to, and we've had a chat beforehand, so it's going to be great. Um, as Donald Trump might have said. Um, a year ago, to the, almost to the day, frankly, I was sitting down in the Cape, just on the, in Cape Town. It might've been in Cape Town, it might've been in France, relaxing for my first proper break ever, frankly, in South Africa after, after the Indaba. Uh, it seems like a hell of a long time ago now. So a year from the start of pandemic and lockdown, I'm looking back on the extraordinary challenges faced globally and on the African con continent resulting in, in what is obviously material suffering everywhere, but it also seems to me to have catalyzed the resilience and innovation of human nature to continue pr to progress, not least demonstrated by the vaccines, which are coming our way hopefully soon. Once again, we're at a tipping point. Uh, we're always at tipping points in Africa, it seems, where Africa is uh, front of mind globally uh, for a whole range of geopolitical, demographic, climate-based 
and business reasons. And with commitment and partnership, not least between public and private sector players, we've got representatives of both today, and on an Africa-wide basis, there should be a roadmap forward. Today, we can test this theory, I think, by looking back to what's been done, uh, looking forward to what can be done, with what I think is becoming a totemic, but not uncontroversial, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement in place. Um, but also, uh, we have to admit, with the inequities of global society, perhaps even plainer to see than ever with some of the things going on. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, my excellent panel. I'll start, I think, um, uh, with Dirk Vandenberg, who's the head of export finance for Southern Africa at the UK Export Finance. And he's also an independent advisor and consultant on the banking, trade and working capital side. And he has uh, years, a decade, I won't say how many decades, because he'll sound like about the same age as me, um, um, at HSBC, where he was head of trade and receivables for five years and with other firms such as ABSA, Nedbank, and Axial Finance. He's also a board member of the Chola Felu Children's Home. Um, Kaseni Dlamini, who um, everybody knows, is a leading African businessman and a good friend. He's currently the chairman of MassMart Limited, which is really interesting, but probably for everybody else's point of view, we're even more interested in uh, his chairmanship of Aspen um, at the moment. His career includes time at iconic African businesses such as Old Mutual South Africa and as head of Anglo-American South Africa. He's active in professional bodies and charities, including the South African Institute of International Affairs, Common Purpose, and on the advisory board of Gibbs. Um, he's well known as a passionate promoter of, of African business, intra-Africa trade across the continent. Uh, Malalu Medela is um, our economist today from Standard Bank um, in the African region on fixed income currency research. For six years prior to her current position, she was an economist for the National Treasury in South Africa. So she brings um, her deep experience in the public sector and the private sector to our discussions. Finally, um, Jean Craven from, is, is well known and uh, I've been reading his blogs and his things, a, a forceful commentator on African matters and South African matters in particular. He is... Um, in his spare time, as it were, the CEO and co-founder of Barak Fund Management Group. And prior to this, he was at Standard Bank and ran Merchant Bank for a number of years. He's increasingly also well known for his extraordinary charity work. And you'll have seen the picture of him swimming um, on, on, his, uh, on, the, on his screensaver, uh, swimming oceans as he is for business. And his business is critical to future supply chain. So, um, that's who we've got. And I wanted to start, I think, um, maybe with Kasani, um and ask the same question to people, but looking at it from their different roles. I mean, Kasani, with your business hats on, how have, how have your businesses managed during COVID? And really, what steps have, have you been able to take to secure success for future growth and development? And where do you see the future for African trade? Obviously, with your, your two business hats on, that's... Uh, it's, it's fascinating to hear your views on that. So, Kaseni, over to you. You can switch your camera on as well so we can all see. Thank, Thank you, you very much, and thanks to Sharon uh, and everyone involved in putting together this conversation, which I, I, I dare say is a very important and relevant strategic conversation for all of us to have now in the, as we go through the second wave of the global pandemic. So to your question, Andrew, I, I think both businesses are spent Pharma care holdings and mass smart holdings, which I'm involved with, had to really respond decisively and very fast and really learn to, to adapt to what was, by all accounts, a black swan event that none of us ever prepared for. At the budgets that we had, the strategic plans that we, we had, we often have a, a, a practice of going through an exercise of planning ahead the, for the year ahead and having very clear strategic priorities and focus areas that we needed to pursue, but COVID disrupted all that. And so we had to, to learn and lead at the same time. We had to uh, put together some emergency task teams that were looking at how best to respond to the COVID pandemic. Uh, our Aspen business being global as it is operating across 50 countries in the world and having a supply chain that spreads across 150 countries 
uh, it was, its resilience and robustness and efficiency was tested. And I'm very pleased that it came out with flying colors and all the patients uh, across the world that relied on Aspen medicines were supplied with the medicines that they needed at the time that they needed it. In fact, some of our teams uh, in, in Europe even came up with a slogan in some of the factories we have in Europe that the patients are waiting. That was a rally and cry to mobilize and really inspire every one mm. of our employees to, to know that it is actually about the patients. It's not about profit. It's like we had to shift our paradigm to put people before profits as it were. And that happened across the organization. And uh, my board colleagues and I were uh, very delighted with the manner in which uh, our organization responded as if it had planned uh, for the crisis. We are even more delighted now that as we are going through the second wave of this global pandemic, uh, Aspen has partnered with Johnson & Johnson to be a manufacturer of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine at our factory in Port Elizabeth here in South Africa and the manufactured products coming out of there will not just be for the South African market or the African market, but it will be for the entire world. And here we are talking about the South African company, an African company founded in the late 1990s in a four bedroom house in Durban, which is now a global pharmaceutical giant operating in first world countries and now being part of this global effort to find a global solution to what is a a global problem. So I, I think one of the things that COVID has really uh, uh, shown is the need to have very robust and world-class globally competitive supply chains. And I think African industrialists and African policymakers, as we talk about the African continental free trade area that you referred to, we cannot realize the promises that it comes with if we do not have a solid industrial base and if we do not have the right capabilities and capacities to be able to produce goods and products for the world, not just for Africa. I think the challenge for African companies is to realize that they, there is a market of over 7 billion people to be serviced. We are happy with the 1.3 billion people that the African continental free trade area is unlocking, but African companies have got to look beyond the 1.3 billion and, and project their footprints to be able to supply relevant products to the whole world, as it were, uh, you look at countries like South Korea have managed to do that, China and, and India and other emerging market economies that have built global giants. And I'm very proud of what Aspen has done for being a, a global company founded in, in South Africa, able to play a role in the EU and across other parts of yeah, the world. I, I, and that's that's fantastic. I mean, I think that's a great a great start. Jean, in your, in, you're right at the sharp end, as it were, of financing the supply chains. Um, how have you seen supply chains, you know, it, it's same question to you really, how have you secured, how are you seeing secured business? But um, has COVID really damaged supply chains and how, has there been a recovery from that as well, would you say? Andrew, fortunately, and, you know, looking back uh, over the last mm -hmm. years, we um, as a management team, you know, right on the onset of COVID, uh, March, this time March last year, we, we, um, we had to, we made some tough calls. You know, we saw headwinds coming, not exactly knowing uh, the detail and the amount of impact that it was going to have across our portfolio. Um, just for information purposes, we financed roughly about 150 entrepreneurial businesses across 25 sub-Saharan uh, countries in Africa. Our portfolio is about one uh, 1.3 billion dollars, um, and mostly working capital. So. So supply chains and logistics is at the heart um, of our exposure. And uh, we, first of all, you know, we, we made a tough call to, you know, to, to provision uh, as most financial institutions uh, similar to us uh, were going through at the time. We, we put up tough provisions. Uh, this was going to impact our bottom line. We, had, we streamlined our business. And then, you know, it became, uh, uh, we embarked on a big task in, 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 in engaging with our role players and saying, uh, we have to hatch it down now for, for a yeah. storm coming and, and a storm not, uh, not very visible for us uh, in terms of how long and how deep it's going to be. Um, you know, we knew that liquidity was going to be a problem and this driven by, you know, by lockdowns, by delays in logistics, by people not being able to, to come to work and, you know, a lot of our business entails um, uh, movement of cargo. 
so the so the the impact was real. Um, it, you know, it fortunate and, and and varied across uh, sectors. I mean, you have sectors like the agricultural markets where where actually COVID benefited the sector. Uh, you know, a lot of ag agri businesses um, in South Africa, especially on the export side, had some of their best years ever. You know, due to them being classified as essential services, I think people. Given the pandemic, everyone wanted to start eating healthier, you know, so there was a demand for fresh fruits and, and, and prices mm. went up. Unfortunately, those logistical chains, to a large extent, did stay intact. There were some delays. But then, you know, flipping to other uh, commodities like mining, um, not as, perhaps non-essential mining, you know, we saw massive delays. We had um, importers of, of uh, mole steel, which is quite a niche product uh, used by uh, one of the large uh, fuel manufacturers in South Africa in the synthetic fuels business. You know, we're shipping delays, normal shipping channels from Spain where they, where they import goods uh, 45 days. A turnaround, this went up to 100 and 180 days. Uh, so massive delays. And also now, even 10 months after the first uh, lockdowns, you know, we've seen uh, the price of, of this product doubling. So, it's, uh, so the impacts are uh, had, had various uh, 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 consequences for our clients across uh, this, uh, the market. But you know, we, um, you know, as as Kuseni, uh, alluded to, his clientele. You know, we, we put our clients first, and we, you know, we sat down with them and 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 and, and discussed how you know how, how can we help you. Um, taking a, 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 a motto from one of our banks in South Africa, but. You know, we we asked. You know, we had to restructure and 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 engage and see. You know, how do we weather this storm? But you know, it taught yeah. us a lot. In hindsight, we we made hard calls initially. By you know, unfortunately, we had to cut back some of our growth initiatives and also staff. Unfortunately, but uh, you know, now we position for the future. And you know, we got to make. Uh, We've got to make uh, things happen. Fortunately, for this free trade agreement, we, we're looking at it uh, quite optimistically. It's going to have its challenges, but uh, it can only benefit a business like ourselves. That's that's really um, that's great, um, Malalo. Maybe you could give us a you know from the economic from your econo economist point of view, working at the bank. How do you see you know the you know what what you know what sort of Curve, what sort of shape recovery or others do you think we've got from that? I know that's a bit of a challenging question for anybody, but uh, maybe give a view on how you see things have been affected where, and where you see us coming out of this in terms of the African continent. Thank you, Andrew, and good day, everyone. I truly hope that you're all doing well, considering the circumstances in the, in the global world right so maybe so to speak uh when we look maybe into africa and also the global world as a as, at large the expectation for this year would largely be based much more on base effects of course we are coming from a very low base effect in 2020 and we could pro potentially see this improve as we go into Q Q uh, 2021 and especially we could see growth much more improving in the second half of the year. Maybe, maybe just to touch on the AFCFTA and what it entails, just so we don't assume that maybe the audience really know what it is all about. Here, the focus is on Africa integration, of course, with a global goal for inclusive and also sustainable development, and also to improve Africa competitiveness globally, right? So that would be the ultimate goal. So the one thing is that when you look back into the agenda of the Africa integration, um, it ran as far back in the 1960s and in the 80s under the Lagos Plan of Action and to Abuja Treaty in the 1990s, which essentially established Africa economic community. So all this have resulted into the establishment of the AFCFTA, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is partly the implementation of the Africa uh, Union Agenda 2063. So one thing that you would look or what you would see in the market is that for so long, African market have been fragmented with a couple of countries with the tiniest maybe population ranging from less than 100,000 population 
for Seychelles to highly populated countries like Nigeria with a population above 200 million. So when you look at this initiative, uh, the main idea here is to bring these small and these big markets together, which make, make much more sense as far as investment is concerned. So this essentially brings together a market of 1.2 billion people with a median age below 20 which essentially show that Africa is quite useful, right? And about $3 trillion uh, GDP. So when you look at this, it should make investment sense. But of course it is uh, with its own challenges. And maybe I'll just touch on that just uh, after I tell you maybe about our analysis. So when you look at the, uh, at the Africa trade, uh, you could actually see that Africa could essentially benefit uh, as far as manufacturing sector is concerned from the AFCFTA. The reason being that when you look at the intra-Africa exports, it accounts for roughly 17% of African exports, with more than 80% going to the rest of the world. But what is contained in there is that this trade with the rest of the world is has a small value addition. So it's mostly consisting of commodities and primary producers and even a layman in the streets would know that and will probably explain that as well. So in a way, Africa only contributes about 0.8% of total manufacturing export in the, uh, globally. But when you look at the intra-African manufacturing exports, it's account, it accounts for about 43% of total African exports, showing that there's more value creation on Africa to Africa trade, which essentially means that increase in trade within Africa should boost manufacturing sector such that we should see investments maybe beginning to flow into the manufacturing sector as opposed to capital chasing, maybe extractive industry, agricultural uh, industry, like we have seen maybe uh, traditionally. Like I have said, there will be challenges faced and of, of, except for all this potential that I have explained within an admission that tariff is not the only significant barrier to inter-Africa trade, right? Yeah. Malala, maybe, I mean, we can, can we pick up the challenges later on? Because I think there are, that was a fantastic exposition of the background and the position on Africa. So maybe pick up the challenges um, uh, in, a, in a subsequent discussion, because I, I think everybody will have their views on that. So thank you for that. Dirk, with the um, sort of same question to you, really, but I think that, I mean, it's really useful to have a, an external view on this, as it were, from the UK. And um, having um, chaired a conversation at the Africa Investors Conference recently, which got rather, for those of you who may have listened to it, got cut rather short. You can, you can help me out by completing what was discussed what are the, I mean, on the UK in Africa, um, Boris Johnson has said he wants it, you know, he wants us to be the partner of choice for Africa, um, which is a great thing for the, the chamber, obviously, to be talking about. But, but where, where do you see we, what have we been doing and what are we intending to do in terms of picking up? And I think uh, moving, as it were, on to the next thing, um, what, are, what is the UK's view of Africa, which is, yeah. particularly interesting in the context of Brexit, of course, but you don't have to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thanks, Andrew, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. It's, it's really good to be on the panel. Um, I think just from a UK point of view, you know, needless to say, the Africa is really, and as you alluded to that, Africa is really a key market for um, UK itself. And then from a UK export finance point of view, you know, during these COVID times, what we have actually done from a UK point of view is actually increase our footprint into Africa. Um, and that is a, a definite sign um, of confidence in the, in, in, in the uh, um, continent as a whole, but also um, our market risk appetite for the, for the continent as a whole itself. Um, you know, just, just by way of example, from a South African point of view, we've got around three billion pounds worth of market risk appetite for South Africa, and it goes up to four and a half billion um, pounds for Botswana and Mauritius and the like. 
Um, other countries too, um, my equivalents, um, Stephen Gray in West Africa and also Isaac Kahara recently appointed to in September last year, looking at um, after the um, East Africa region. And then also we're getting somebody else that will look after the Egypt region itself, or Egypt and North Africa region it's, itself too. And that's just to say that we are really committed to, to the continent as a whole. Um, you know, during this time, from a South African point of view, there's been a sovereign downgrade, um, as we all know. From a UKIF point of view, we haven't reduced our market risk appetite. As a matter of fact, we um, have increased that. And we also really see that as a key market to grow the, 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 the economy as a whole, both from a UK point of view and then from a South African point of view. And the key thing for me is also to work very closely with South African corporates and companies, as well as government, um, to make that happen. And then, you know, this will go through to the rest of Africa as well. So I think it's, you know, just to, to say we've got a very keen market risk appetite, very defined. It's clear, clearly stated, um, you know, on our website, um, you know, if anybody's got any interest in that, it's, it's actually, you know, very public knowledge and information of, to see where it is. Some countries are, you know, are better users, if I can put it off, ECA business, export credit agency business, and funding structures than others. Haven't had massive success from a UK point of view in South Africa itself. I think post-COVID, given the sovereign downgrade, given the economy and the, um, just the economy as a whole, um, I think government will also look at alternative ways. Interesting stat, and I don't want to get involved with stats or anything like that, but just um, stats that's just been released by the D UK DIT um, as of the 11th of February indicates up to the end of September 2020 for year-on-year -year comparison that the total, total trade between the UK and South Africa has dropped by some 21%. It still is 8 billion pounds, which is still significant, but it has dropped. Um, you know, and there's, there, again, it can be broken down. I don't want to get too involved with all of that. But I think all of that um, said, Andrew, very keen to, to remain in territory, in region, strong focus on that. And, you know, specialists like myself in the various um, regions throughout Africa hopefully we can play an important and increasingly important role from a UK point of view. Yeah, thank, and I think that's, and, and I, I've seen um, that the, the, the UK government is very supportive of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement as well, uh, at least that that's what they've been saying. Is that, I mean, how, how, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, as well. You know, I think we, we were instrumental with helping, you know, with some of the negotiators itself. Um, it, they, I think it's important for us to take that one step forward, um, you know, and, 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 and be part of any ongoing discussions, etc., um, where we can assist and where we can guide. I think the key thing for me is to make sure that, you know, there's a common vision in Africa as a whole. Um, and where we can influence through the high commissioners, et cetera, and ambassadors, um, you know, in, in bilateral discussions with the various countries, I think we will certainly play a role as and where we can. Yeah, thank, and I think that, you know, going back to what Malala was saying, is this, um, uh, people have been saying this for a long time, whether it's, you know, President Nana in, in Ghana started this, adding value in Africa for, for Africans, I think is where, where people are coming from. Going back, Jean, to you, I mean, in terms of, the, you said you were positive about Africa. I mean, I, you know, I hear ranges of, com of comments from this is the best thing ever, um, particularly now Nigeria and South Africa, who were the, probably the most reluctant, being the biggest to join. Um, probably they didn't have Malala advising them as, as an economist on what the, what the advantages to them would be, but now they are there. Uh, but do you see, um, do you see it being a really positive thing or do you think it's just uh, um, it's a nice idea which has um, which will take too long to implement? Well, how do you see it? And, you know, how do you see it from your business? You know, as a business person right in this space, is it really going to make a difference? You're muted. You're being so no, controversial yeah, but, that you, yeah. you, you were being so controversial that you didn't want everybody else to hear what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the... Yeah, I mean, on that, Andrew. The uh, again, uh, it's a uh, the, the 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 sort and direction. Yeah, is in the right direction. Um, uh, uh, the proof's going to be in the pudding. 
Um, you know, typically, you know, one of the big curse words of Africa is the word potential. It's been a curse yeah. word for the last 50, 60 years, you know. I, rem of, I remember and, Adesino saying at a conference, which you were probably at, that you can't yeah. eat potential. <laughs> exactly. So a lot of us kind of, you know, I, th I think there's agreement now amongst uh, the role players for setting up this platform. And like many uh, instances in Africa, what now needs to happen is governments actually need to step back. They need to get, uh, they need to uh, contribute to make it easier to do business. Um, I mean, just take South Africa, you know, what, what's killing investment in South Africa? You have labor unions, you know, these, you know, minimum wages, you know, I mean, I'm, I'll say, you know, BEE to a large extent, although the idea is noble, you know, it's, it's dissuading foreign direct investment. You know, people who want it, for this to work, the continent will need investment. I mean, we've, I mean, we deal with 95% uh, of, of our investors are non-African investors. And, you know, we've had cases uh, in South Africa with great examples with great job creation in manufacturing where there's a BE requirement that the foreigner says, you know what, I'm rather going to build this plant in Chile where I don't have to give away 30% of my company. And, and this is unfortunately reality. Um, so, you know, government intervention has not done this continent well. So, so this, this uh, free trade area, great initiative. But, you know, we, you know like, any, like any business, you need to understand your strengths and weaknesses. And um, uh, the governments have failed dismally in terms of implementation on this continent. So let the, free, let the, let the, let the, the private sector come in and, and do its thing. You know, we've opened up, we're opening up playing fields here. Let's open up for investment. You know, let's uh, lift all these restrictive barriers. You know, and 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 policies, changing of policies. I mean, DRC mining is is and, and Zambia. I mean, you just name it. You know, where governments get involved in terms of policy changes, uncertainty for investors in South Africa. You know, trade uncertainties. I mean, look at our mining sector. It's not done that great the last 10, 20 years. Why? Because of government intervention. So my message is great initiative now step back you know quite frankly but i think and, yeah know. i that's that's a really uh that's a really clear way of putting it i mean my my concern is and maybe kasani picked this up my concern is that uh that government is just there so it has to do something and it's much better if it does things which are clear certain and in partnership with the private sector kasani with your your you deal across the so um, I'm not sure. I'm, you're wishing for something which may be impossible, Jean, I suspect, but that's that's uh, maybe not. Hussaini, what your view on, because you do business everywhere, on the ground with Masna, um, is Af I mean, yeah. Africa should therefore, I guess, you, you should be able to speak to Africa particularly well. So how, yeah, if, how do you see it? Yeah, if I recall well, uh, when the African Continental Free Trade Area was signed in Kigali in 2018 in March. Yeah. I, I was lucky to be there to, to witness the signing by heads of states and also to hear them, you know, expressing their explicit commitment. And my experience from a point of view of bilateral engagements uh, with authorities across the continent, they leave me with a lot of confidence that at least they understand the imperative to create a conducive environment for investors and maybe to Jen's point, that, that understanding does not translate into them doing the right things at the right time, at the right speed to be able to build investor confidence. But I must say, if I look at the last five years, I'm more encouraged that most African leaders are starting to do the right thing and are starting to create good environments. I mean, Jan was referring to BEE in South Africa, deterring foreign investors. I think most uh, sophisticated investors understand that you cannot operate in the market where the majority of people are excluded. It's part of the license to operate, to create inclusive economic structures where uh, you expand the circle of beneficiaries and minimize the circle of users. On the investment side, my experience in interacting with international investors is that there's a lot of interest in looking at opportunities in South Africa and elsewhere in Africa. Ford recently just invested 16 billion rent into South Africa, just at the height of the of the current crisis. We had PepsiCo uh, from the USA buying a major food company here in South Africa on the energy space, like in the renewable energy space. We've got one of the most attractive 
IPP programs in the world, in the water space. But I'm not saying things are perfect. I think business leaders have got to do the heavy lifting in terms of nudging policymakers to create the right ecosystems, the right policy architecture that, is, that provides predictability and certainty for investors to be able to invest. And we also need to balance in terms of our focus on foreign investors and local investors. You cannot ignore the, the challenge or indeed the opportunity to build local productive forces and have local capitalists that are going to underpin the growth uh, of Africa. You look at Asia, uh, you look at uh, Europe, you look at most uh, regions that are successful. They are not re really reliable only on foreign investment. It's a combination of domestic investment as well as foreign investment. Yeah, no, that um, um, Malala may be picking up on on that point. I, I just think that the uh, and then and Dirk maybe following on from Malala, maybe the, the sort of uh, you know the the, the the public sector DFI multilateral support, which has been given to support private sector development, I think is you know, it just seems to me to be the key. I mean, maybe not you know may, it may be in only certain areas, but. Uh, Lalo, picking picking up on that, do you see with the AFCA, you were talking about, and it's something I've heard a lot of, the scale, the, the level of scale across the 54 countries in Africa is simply hasn't been big enough for people to invest. Do you think picking up on what both Jean and Ksenia are saying, that if it works, there will be more investment both locally within Africa and internationally into the supply chains, particularly whether that's down to the factories, the logistics, all the things which make up the supply chain. Do you think that's going to going to be more easy now? Um, and uh, you know, maybe picking up one of the barriers, you know, sort of not just tariff barriers, but but in you were talking about. So maybe pick up on that point now, and then Dirk, maybe you could come in on that with how you see international investment, as it were, through you know, in your case the UK, but in other cases, how that can support this rather than act as the usual sort of world hopping public sector sort of holding up which Sean's basically talking about. How, how can it be nimble? Maybe that's for you later, Dirk. So maybe Malali, start with that. So definitely uh, the one thing that we know about this AFCFTA is that it's not going to come without challenges, right? And one of which, and which re actually require a lot of long orientated long term orientated capital is infrastructure efficiency and infrastructure development mm -hmm. right so the one thing that you were, you would see is that although there they have been investment coming through into africa we have seen that the africa africa infrastructure consortium of africa has stated that in 2018 um like investment in infrastructure increased by roughly 24%, surpassing like 100 billion in, in 2018. But it is mm. still below the African Development Bank estimate that maybe the annual infrastructure should be about 130 billion to 170 billion dollars per year to really close the infrastructure deficit uh, gap by 2025. So the one thing there, when you're also maybe looking at African governments currently, is that uh, it will be very difficult for them to finance infrastructure development due to the uh, fiscal pressures that we have seen. And it has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So... Of course, this really brings in the importance of the public uh, or the public-private partnership. So that is where maybe some opportunities currently come through as far as Africa is concerned. So this would provide opportunities to investors involved much more on uh, or interested in infrastructures, uh, infrastructure projects, right? But the one thing maybe uh, that is a challenge there is maybe bureaucracy in Africa. But equally, I think I agree with the audience that there is a need of alignment as far as this trade facilitation policies that we have seen. It has to be aligned with macroeconomic policy, uh, labor policy. Um, I think uh, I have heard a lot about that. Industrial policy as well, investment promotion policies, and also like in other parts of Africa, tax policies as well. 
because I think I don't think investors would want to be maybe slapped with a with a tax bill from nowhere. So there's really a need for uh, this coordination from all the stakeholders that are are involved in this to really ensure this uh, to ensure that this bear it uh, the, the, this initiative bear fruit. Because yeah. there are many uh, non-tariff uh, barriers that are there, and I think I have just touched on the infrastructure side of it. Yeah, I mean, fiscal. You know, as a lawyer, also how, how you you know, it's all very well having an agreement if you can't enforce it in the relevant places. That is also a challenge, and I know people are working on that. So maybe picking up the points I was talking to you about, how you know the facility is essentially using. Um, public investment, if I want a better word, to facilitate trade rather than uh, um, and to facilitate public private sector operations rather than essentially taking over private sector. Yeah. Andrew, I think I'm, I just want to agree with Jean first and foremost to say that Africa remains a very attractive market for so many companies and also countries and then the UK itself as well. But I do want to say and just add to, to his point that one needs to have ease of use. Um, it needs to be easy to, you know, to do business in South Africa. And South Africa in 2019, I think um, we were 84th out of a number of 150 of ease of using, uh, of, of doing business in, you know, with, with the country itself. Um, UK, on the other hand, was eighth. So now you've got UK partners looking at relative easy doing you know, a way of doing business in the UK. They more, you know, they used to that type of thing, and then they come to the bureaucracy of South Africa. The other thing, also from a from an investment point of view, is you know, people investors want to have certainty and they want to have security at the end of the day. Um, you know, and 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 I think that's very important. And something that also I'm picking up and that you know that's been in the market for many for many many years is the slow decision making processes both in government, but also corporates. And at the end of the day, you know, um, companies come in, they look at making foreign and direct investment at the end of the day. Um, you know, decisions need to be taken for licenses or whatever the case may be. And it's just so extended and so prolonged that, you know, they actually lose confidence and they just go elsewhere, uh, the rest of the world itself, or maybe other parts of Africa. Um, with a free trade agreement, obviously that's a, that, that will help the continent itself because from there it can work out to the other countries, um, so to speak. I think just to say, you know, there's, there's been quite a bit of FDI investment um, over the years. And from a UK point of view, it was in 2019, 2020, it was around about 15 billion pounds. Um, you know, and I think that um, could probably double or more, you know, if it's the right environment really at the end of the day. Um, you know, for me, it's important to see there's more and more requests coming for, for us to, from a DIT point of view, but also from a UK point of view, to get involved with transactions and projects um, and to try and stimulate and facilitate discussions with government and other corporates, um, you know, um, local corporates as well, um, just to see how we can kickstart this. And I think it's important to start doing business um, you know, whether it's one transaction, two transactions, before the companies will then consider large-scale foreign investment, so to speak. You know, they need to find that comfort um, in the country, whether it's South Africa or the rest of Africa itself. And then let's also not, you know, hide away from the corruption issues and things in the country as a whole. I think that's a deterrent at this point of time for many, many companies um, you know, that, yeah. that it's a wait and see game, and, and, and yeah. really they need. No, no, I, yeah, I, I, I understand that, but I think a lot of what I'm hearing is that, you know, it's a, really investors should seek to understand a lot of the time delays are caused by investors not actually understanding the position. Because the truth is, there's corruption all over the world and not just in Africa. And I think people need to be realistic about, you know, and yet people invest all over the world. So I think it's important for people to. To understand that, what I'd like—I uh, mean, I think the, the, probably the final question before Sharon comes in and asks us our questions and then shuts us down very quickly—I'm very, I'm very interested in this proposition, which I see the African Union have been pushing forward as well. That uh, as Africa as essentially a, a new hub for the supply chain, hub for supply chains, um, taking over effectively from China. I, 
challenge I, I sort of concern whether that's you know I can see it moving that way and I was always taught that you should never put all your eggs in one supply basket but Kaseni maybe given your global supply chain how do you see do you see Africa particularly with the free trade agreement becoming a, a bigger hub for supply global supply chain and taking advantage of that no absolutely Andrew that, that's a massive opportunity for Africa mm. now on the as part and parcel of reconstructing and developing economies from the issues of, of COVID. In our retail business, for example, when COVID struck, we started looking at our supply chain and started looking at opportunities to source locally. And uh, we are developing medium to long-term strategies to partner with manufacturers that can supply us in the medium to long-term uh, without us having to import goods from the Far East, for example. We have set up a supply development fund. We've got about 23 companies that are enrolled uh, from there that are supplying us products to, to our stores in South Africa and in Africa. And some of those local suppliers are, are able to walk the whole journey with us to be able to get opportunities to supply to Walmart uh, globally. So I think there is massive opportunity for us to look at industrialization differently, look at building manufacturing capabilities and capacities uh, locally for our own needs, but also with a view to export more to the rest of the world. I think that's that's really, and it's certainly something which people like Dangote and others are pushing very hard at the moment. So I think there's a there's a, a private sector push behind this as well. Jean, how do you, and with your, you know, you do trade globally. How, do you see this as being a, a trend? Yeah, well, there's obviously a uh, a political uh, backdrop to this as well. I guess diversifying away from Chinese risk, but uh, yeah, at, absolutely. In the lot, in the long term, I think, you know, like most things, supply and demand is going to dictate where products are going to flow, driven by price. So is, are we as a continent going to be uh, competitive from a price point of view? Or are, are we going to increase our logistical capability, our you know, capacity to move goods at a reasonable price? You know, the Ugandan coffee farmer is getting two cents in the dollar for his coffee, you know, where Starbucks is, is taking the other one well, and the rest of the value chain, but it just shows you how inefficient we currently are. So yes, there again is the opportunity to do that. But it was, I mean, one thing privatize, you know, privatize, you know, take an example, look at our great state-run companies in South Africa, how great they all do. We're not going to go into depth of that, but it just shows you, you know, government should not be involved in business, you know, set policies, set, a conducive place to do business and then you know let business take care of itself but i think if we can if we can show investors transparency which will eradicate the, the dreaded word corruption which we're not allowed to talk about but you know be transparent get efficient get effective and yes and be competitive in the global environment because that's you know else it's going to remain talk we've got to be competitive yeah. in terms of a, of a price offering globally yeah, well i guess with angola's 200 plus privatizations we'll see that we we may see that in practice if they get those over the over the line but Lalo, with yeah. just uh, i'm conscious that sharon's about to ask us some questions but i think picking up that um do you see the efficiencies but the essentially what jean's talking about is that if it whilst at the time when it's cheaper to get your in your manufacturing inputs from china even though it take than it is from next door country that's not going to change do you see that changing Do you see the supply chain becoming more efficient within within Africa, potentially as a result of Africa? But because if it doesn't, then as Jean quite rightly says, it's supply and demand. So do you see that happening? Definitely. One, one thing when you're looking at that is that a meaningful improvement away from that will definitely take uh, some time, right? And this will also take Africa progressing in eliminating these challenges that we have spoken about and also non-tariff barriers as well. Because you're looking at a, a position where we are, like in Africa, where like uh, the custom delays is still there, transport costs is still significantly high. And to really think that this is these problems will just go away overnight maybe would be 
quite, um, I think it would be quite ignorant. So in a way that it will take time for us to really get to a point where um, Africa can um, efficiently supply or efficiently export its, its goods across Africa without all this um, yeah, but, but you see the. About... Sorry, I, I I understand this isn't a silver bullet because nothing ever is in this world. But do you see this as a um, a positive trend? There should be a positive trend gradually. Um, like maybe so to think when, when you're looking at this whole uh, AFCFTA situation is that what they are planning to do is to have a linear reduction of the tariff, right? So the first thing, yep. the, very, the, the, the most important impact is coming from that. We, we are not expecting a, a, a one at a go a reduction or a complete elimination of tariffs at, at one go. So there will be a gradual elimination of tariffs between five to 10 years. So which essentially really in, um, shows the timeline it is likely to take uh, Africa okay. to really get to a point where it, it will focus on Africa supply chain. But without that, without even focusing at that, you also need to be taken into consideration of all the non-tariff barriers that still needs to be eliminated before Africa can really purely de yeah. depend on Africa. That's true. And I guess it took us 40, 40 years in the UK and now we've decided we don't like it anyway. So, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, we, we, we can come back to you, but Sharon, you look like you've got pressing questions to ask. And since we only have seven minutes left, maybe you want to ask some piercing questions to my excellent panel. Thanks, everyone. Some really interesting points have been brought across, and we've got quite a few questions that have that have been posed, some which have been addressed in some of the conversations. But one of the things I'd just like to ask is, is there any benefit that the COVID crisis has brought to Africa and Africa free trade by forcing change at a pace faster than we would normally have Africa would normally have developed. We've seen it in lots of industries. Uh, if you just look at vaccines as an example, something that would have taken 10 years has taken less than a year. Is, are there any examples in the Africa environment where COVID has actually totally shortened, totally removed, reduced, fixed, addressed things in a very positive way? I think that's probably, I mean, Kuseni, you were picking up, so you were talking, we, we've talked about this in the past, you and I. So. Um, I think there were a couple of things you were talking about and also Jean in terms of the way you you know you addressed how to deal with things and you were looking back and saying you you now feel better for it so Kaseni maybe thanks Andrew and thanks Sharon just to pick up an example from the pharmaceutical sector in the first wave we saw the emergence of PPE nationalism in the second wave of the pandemic we're seeing vaccine nationalism and when the first wave PPE nationalism was happening uh, there was already debate on industrial policy, on manufacturing, building uh, capacity within Africa to be able to be self-sufficient. And even now on the vaccine issue with vaccine nationalism, there's even more debate and more discussion uh, that uh, I think has been forced by COVID. To your question, Sharon, for people to think differently about global supply chains and think differently about local industrialization in ways that promote self-sufficiency, that promote resilience and robustness of domestic supply chains. So I think that's a positive sign. On the retail side, we, we, we also are thinking long and hard as retailers to de-risk concentration risk in terms of sourcing most of your products from one region or one country. And we're, we're thinking creative, we are partnering with government where it makes sense, partnering with financial institutions and entrepreneurs and building capacity where we can. We employ industrial engineers, to, to come and intervene and improve productivity in the manufacturing companies that uh, we are supporting. So I think there is a lot of change that is happening, which has been forced by the pandemic. And I think that's one positive thing and it's a positive takeaway from the global pandemic that we are dealing with. Thanks, John. And then maybe Dirk, something, you, have government learned anything from this? John, very briefly, John, for... You were saying earlier that you felt that you were, you almost you've come out of this better, really, in terms of your management processes, maybe. Yeah, well, I think I guess uh, you know the the, the our, our our Africa has handled the uh, the whole uh, COVID uh, the virus uh, is uh, uh, I guess is testimony to you know we are a resilient bunch of people you know we've uh, you know learned to adapt you know we've had a lot of pandemics hit this continent so we kind of I guess 
maybe a bit more used to these external shocks. But certainly, you know, I think that, that you know, we're certainly in, in our space, you know, a lot of private sector companies have, have, have adapted. You know, I mentioned the, on the agri space in, in, in South Africa, as example, where a lot of your agri exports, perhaps to Europe and the UK, were also just a hard hit, you know, we've seen a lot of exports switch over to, to the near and far east, you know, where eating habits have improved. So people were early adapters and, uh, you know, that's come through. I think what is good for this continent is its resilience, you know, and, and its ability to adapt in crisis. So, you know, I know it sounds a bit fine, the sky stuff, but, it, you know, we've seen it come through um, recently. Um, one of our clients in DRC, I mean, Thins jumped by 70%, you know, this client's actually... Uh, you know, uh, went to artisanal miners around him, you know, gave them tools and, you know, they mined extra tin and, ex, you know, they, that, you know, boost the productivity overall and, and are exporting, you know, out of, um, um, out of DRC. So, you know, again, you know, the African initiative in the face of, of, uh, of these global impacts is still resounding. We, we are resounding yeah. people. Uh, and that, uh, that's, I think, I think that's a, a great answer. And Dirk, very, very quickly, maybe have, how do you have you seen, as it were, government have government re, learnt to react better and quicker and or in a more focused way over the period? Well, I would hope so, uh, Andrew. I'm not 100% certain of that, but um, you know, I would <laughs> hope so. But I think the important thing for me is to remain close to the market, remain close to the suppliers, and let's also not forget the SMEs. I think we talk, you know, infrastructural developments, etc. But the SMEs make a very large percentage of the. Um, population and the market and the business in Africa itself, I think as 90 or 95%, um, you know, so very important to look at the SMEs as well. Um, I know Sharon's going to give us the evil eye just now, so I'm going to stop with that. <laughs> Let us ask one quick question. Um, I think maybe Malalu and um, John or Dirk, I'm not quite sure who's going to be able to help best on this one, but just the area around, you've obviously got certain infrastructure foundations that exist within any country for it to work, uh, transport, communications, electricity, water, those kind of things. In the electricity space, Africa has been very much coal orientated. Now with ESG and COP26 and those kind of evolutionary changes that are occurring globally, how is Africa dealing with that transition and will the trade agreement related to it support it or complicate the opportunity for that kind of evolution of the energy sector in Africa. You've also got the SME influence mm. as well, off-grid kind of activities. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll, yeah, Sharon, I'll maybe kick off. Um, I mean, ex a practical example, we've got quite uh, one of our outstanding clients in Ghana, uh, you know, which we've uh, helped over the last few years. Um, they provide electricity to large sector the mining sector up there you know which is generating a lot of jobs and foreign currency and they've they've been able to make a transition between you know coal side of uh, of their business towards um and gas and fortunately unfortunately a lot with the help of the chinese who we've seen uh, quite active in the market and um, and you know they are looking to broaden their exposure now in west africa so i think with the breakdown in barriers um uh, you know given this agreement uh, you know th this would facilitate their spread you know of, of their ip and and hopefully investment into the west african economies you know as, as a grouping so so i do think it's it, it's positive and and we are we are seeing transitions uh, in the sector. I mean, a lot of the capital partners like banks, you know, have been driven much harder to do this transition in terms of the, the products that the projects that are willing to fund. But definitely it's, it's, it's going to be, it's, we, we have to unfortunately make this move. You know, it's not just uh, the, for the sake of money, but it's for the breathing of fresh air and seeing the sun uh, in the next hundred years. Malalu, anything you want to add quickly before I give the last question back to Andrew? So maybe just to add from a macroeconomic uh, perspective, as the one thing that you have seen that the increase in infrastructure financing in Africa came through much more from the energy sector and also um, the IC sector. And now with the AFCFTA, you would expect that to come through much more. Maybe we would see that playing much role in 2029 and 2020 when the data comes out. But definitely I would expect the AFCFTA 
ETA to play a much bigger role in expectation that maybe investment in um, energy sector, power sector, and any, anything, the overall infrastructure development would have a much more gain uh, now compared to a period before we have we had the AFC FTA. Now you are looking at a market which, much, which is much more uh, combined compared to a market which was much more fragmented before. So definitely the expectation would be for a much more better investment into the sectors going forward. Thank you. We will pick yeah. up the remaining questions and we will um, address those in the correspondence that we feed back to everybody afterwards. Unfortunately, we can't go right. through the rest of them. Andrew, over to you for the last word. Um, just, uh, sorry, I... Last question. This because I, I want to, because <clears throat> I'm keen to know what's kept people going during this wretched lockdown. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know Jean's question, Jean's answer to this, so I'm going to go to him last and he can tell us what his next project is. But uh, maybe, Dirk, start with you. Uh, just a sort of 20 second. So nothing, how, how nothing. Do we, how, do we, how do we get through this? So, so, so for me, it was important to just have a little bit of a change of scenery. And I actually spent four months um, at uh, Coastal Property um, just to have a change of scenery. Working from home makes it quite easy to, to be anywhere. Um, and then also just for my sins, I did some uh, practical vocational training for six months with the Law Society. Oh, my goodness me. Being a lawyer. <laughs> that's wow. That's great. Malali, I'm not quite sure I like the way this is going. Malali? So the one thing that I can say is that we all need to take care of our bodies so that we can be able to, to serve better, right? So what I have been right doing all along is meditating a lot. I've been running uh, a lot and also reading books, which has essentially kept me going. So uh, uh, for us to be able to serve our businesses, for us to serve uh, the continent, to serve the, you know, the whole uh, global economy, uh, we we need to take care of ourselves. That is what I have Thank been doing. you. And, and, and be present, as they say. Kusaini? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for me, Andrew, it was a great opportunity to get to know my neighborhood better and connect <laughs> with the, the neighborhood. So I enjoyed the walks yeah. that I was taking around. I got to know uh, neighbors that I didn't know they were neighbors, people that uh, I know, but mm -hmm. I didn't know they were living in the same neighborhood. So it's been, really, been, been great fun indeed. Yeah, and I've, so I've got to know my wife after 35 years of being away. So that was that was rather nice. Jean, and you, she's not, I think she's probably hearing that, so I'll shut up now. Uh, Jean, finally, finally to you with your, because Jean does extraordinary things. So what, what, what have you been doing and what are you doing next? And then I'll hand back to Sharon to say goodbye. And thank you to everybody. Yeah, um, Andrew, you, you touched base on the swims we do for raising charities. We've got about yeah. 24 charities, most in South Africa, children's charities that we raise funding through doing extreme swims. So in during COVID and the lockdown, we obviously weren't allowed to swim and all, neither travel, you know, and being doing business in Africa, we travel quite a lot. So I miss both of those very much. So we, you know, had to do a lot of that in our minds. And, and two years ago, we broke the world record of the highest swim in, on, a, on a lake in, uh, in Chile. And, it, yeah. and uh, that record got subsequently broken. So me and my uh, team leader got uh, started planning. And so we're going to be carrying up a, a makeshift pool to base camp two on Everest. Uh, oh, hopefully like next year. And they're going to be pouring up uh, water in there, melting the ice. So that's going to be the highest swim, new highest swim in the world. And hopefully the highest swimming pool in the world. So at least we could do some virtual traveling and virtual swimming. That kept us uh, quite going during the period. I think that's a fantastic end, and pe people must keep their keep their eyes on that and make appropriate contributions because that sounds totally crazy to me. But uh, thank you to everybody, and back to you, Sharon. That was a that certainly wasn't boring. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you to everybody, and firstly to Andrew for um, what's it um, me mediating. A very, very Medi interesting Yeah, session. mediating Medi probably is the best way of putting it. Um, <laughs> no, that probably isn't quite. Um, what, what's the, the word I'm looking for? Moderating. moderating. That's the word I'm looking for. Thanks for moderating. We actually got some really interesting points out, some uh, diverse perspectives and some very detailed perspectives as well. I think there'll be a lot of value add uh, to everyone that um, 
they've received in this. And to Dirk, Malalu, Jean and Kuseni, thank you very much for your individual insights. Your degree of depth of knowledge in your respective areas is amazing. And Kuseni, I think we could ask you for a thousand more times what exactly is going on in the vaccine world, but I don't think everyone needs to listen to that much longer. So thanks very <laughs> much. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for leading us through this. A and pleasure. Thank you once again you, for everybody. the relationship with Hogan Levels. And from the South African Chamber, thank you to all our participants, of which we had a good number attending today. It was really yeah. wonderful that you shared the morning with us. Um, and on that note, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, right. everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Yes.